For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming, out, uh, coming down from heaven uh, from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. This is God's word. Lord Jesus, we just come before you. We just thank you for the hard work that Andrew's put in uh, to uh, prepare a sermon for us. Lord, give us uh, listening ears and and uh, receptive hearts, Lord, to hear what we have, and Lord, may these uh, words that he's prepared uh, just change the way that we do life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, where'd you go? Right there. Teleported. Have a seat. That is 100% my bad, so everyone know that wasn't Bob or John's fault. That's my bad. All righty. <clears throat> we are a storied people. Despite the claims of the Enlightenment and postmodernism, what moves humanity forward is not merely logic or reason. It is not facts or studied theories. What moves the story forward are stories. The research is out. Our brains are literally wired for stories. Stories are how we make sense of ourselves, each other, and the world we live in. And stories have this beautiful ability to bypass our defensiveness and skepticism and speak right into the human soul. We all know a bad story, right? It is the movie you sleep through, or even if it's so bad, walk out of. It is the song that you skip in the playlist. It is the book that you start but close to never open again, right? Those are all bad stories, but the best stories, the best stories are the ones that move the human heart and leave us asking the question, how shall I live? Recently, I watched um, inter like parts of Interstellar again, which if you haven't seen that film, Leave now and go watch it. No, I'm just kidding. But really, put it on your list. Nolan is a mastermind. And I was talking actually with a friend about the movie this week. But there's this scene at the end of the movie. And I might be spoiling it for you, but I don't care at this point. If you haven't seen it, that's your bad. Um, so the, basis premise, the basic premise of Interstellar is that they're trying to find a planet that's inhabitable for humans. And Matthew McConaughey, which guys, it's Matthew McConaughey, you know. He leaves um, as this astronaut into space to go and find this place. Well, anyways... He has to leave his family behind, and the way that space travel works, it's going to be, at the very least, decades before he gets back, if not much longer. Well, the whole movie happens, all kinds of crazy things that I won't spoil for you, but he finally makes it back to his daughter, and he has not aged, but she is in the twilight of her life. And so he is sitting there with her, and uh, he had given her a watch before he left, which plays a huge part in the film, Easter Egg, but anyways... Um, and he's talking with her, and he essentially asks her, how did you know that I was going to come back? And she said, because my dad promised me he would. Oh, dude, the tears, the soundtrack, boom, that's storytelling. You know what I'm saying? That's the stuff that moves the human heart, and that's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about. And as a community, we have been going through a series entitled The Story of God, where we've been looking at the story of the scripture based in each of its acts. And the story of the scriptures leave us asking that very same question, how then shall I live? Uh, the series is broken out into six acts, creation, fall, Israel, Jesus, the church, and new creation. And today, I hope you're ready. We're going to be taking on two of the acts in the church and new creation. We couldn't do anything about water not working a couple weeks ago on Mother's Day. So you're going to buckle up for a ride today. I hope you're ready. You ready? Oh, come on. That was weak sauce. Thank you. All right. I have a few. I've got a few loyal people out there who are ready to do this. The rest of you, we're going to drag you along the way. 
So, to tell this story, I want to begin at the end of the story in a very, like, Scorsese way, you know, move our way back. Um, and so, we're going to be answering two fundamental questions today. How does the story end? How then shall I live? How does the story end? And how then shall I live? Now, before we address those two questions, there is kind of an elephant in the room that I need to address, and it's this. There is a danger of living in the wrong story. Over the last several weeks, we've been talking about the story of God that we find in the scriptures. Now, there's a version of this story that is incredibly popular, but it contains in it, at best, half-truths, maybe quarter-truths, and some right outright, just they filled in the blanks on their own, and it's foreign to the story of the Bible, but if you were to ask somebody what they think you believe is, chances are they would say something like this. So this is the wrong story. There is three kind of spaces. There's earth, there's heaven, where God is, and it's like a lot of clouds, disembodied spirits, golden harps, singing, creepy angel babies with wings, you know. It's weird if we're totally honest, but it's better than the other place, so we just kind of take it as it is. And it's like a perpetual worship service. So we're just going to be singing for all of eternity, and that's what a lot of people believe about heaven. Then there's the other place, which is hell, which is like an inferno and God's like personal torture chamber where he's just hurting humanity for all of existence forevermore. And then there's earth where you and I live. And the essential telling of this story is that all of human history is moving forward to this point, this final judgment where we will either go to the good place or the bad place. Now, some people kind of think that if that horizontal line is your life, that you can kind of plot your life on that trajectory, right? And if you have like a, enough things north of the border, you're doing pretty good. You know what I'm saying? You help the old lady across the street, you pay your taxes, you go to church, you give some money to that thing, you know? You're overall a good person, you know? You're putting some plots up there. And there are things then you do that bo are below the line, like talking smack about your coworker behind their back, or, you know, having a little bit too much wine for dinner, or the other things that you don't want to talk about and you hope that nobody else knows about, that's below the line. But somehow, some way, hopefully, there's enough things north of the border, you know, to even this whole thing out. So at the end of everything, you get to go to the good place. Now, there's a caveat there. Some people interject there and say, well, actually, um, what gets you to the good place is not necessarily all the things that you do, but it's believing the right information, right? If you hold the right theology about Jesus, God, what he did for you on the cross, then you get to go to the good place. Now, that's a story, but it's not the story that the scriptures are telling. If you've been with us throughout this whole thing, nowhere do we find that story. That story has been implemented and added in, and frankly, it's wrong. Now, some of you might be thinking, I thought that was the story the whole time. We were going to explain a little bit of that today. So, over the last several weeks, we've been looking at this story, and that story behind me is not found. Now, here's the danger. If we live in the wrong story, we lead the wrong lives. Because the stories we believe shape the futures we live into. If we believe the whole story is just about getting to heaven when we die, this deeply impacts the way we live here and now. The danger of believing in the wrong story is that we might mislive. The story we actually find in the scriptures is something far more compelling than the one you just heard. And now we get to looking forward to new creation, and this is the right story. So. The Bible opens up, and heaven and earth are one shared space. God and humanity are together. Now, it is good. It is not perfect. We did a ton of work on that in, in previous sermons. But humanity chooses to define good and evil on their own terms, and they rebel. And in doing so, heaven and earth are ripped apart. God's space and our space are torn. But God initiates a plan to restore himself and his presence to uh, the earth again. And it becomes fully realized in the person and work of Jesus. All last week, we talked about how Jesus was the fulfillment, the culmination, the climax of this story. Looking forward to the day 
where heaven and earth are reunited again. Now, we find the culmination of this story, the, the ending of this story, rather, in the book of Revelation. Note, it is not the book of Revelations. There's no S at the end. It's Revelation. So just so you have that out, impress your friends at lunch. Now, this book is probably the most controversial book in all of the scriptures, right? It's like those people who are like slightly deranged in their basement with their YouTube channel, trying to like predict all the ends of the world and things like that. They're like in the basement pointing to the whiteboard behind them. They've got these red dots, right? Trying to calculate the end of the world. There's those kind of people. And then for the rest of us, if we're honest, it's just kind of weird. We're unsure of what to do with it. We leave that to other people to like discuss and debate and we just like hold on to Jesus and let revelation be weird. Now, that's our relationship with this book. That was not the ancient revelation with this book, or the ancient relationship with this book. The revelation of Jesus, this final installment in the scriptures, is a part of an ancient literature, an ancient way of writing that was familiar to the Jewish people and to the people of God. It is known as apocalyptic literature. Now, that might be aligning with what you think about it already. Like, yeah, apocalyptic, end of the world, like nuclear bombs, mark of the beast, the whole shebang, right? No. Apocalyptic in its uh, meaning in the Greek is apocalypsis, and it literally means to uncover or to reveal. Imagine a curtain being pulled back, and you see behind the curtain that is an apocalypsis. It is an unveiling, a revealing. And essentially, the purpose of this book is like not a secret code that you need like a secret decoder ring to figure out the end of the world, but rather it is an uncovering of reality. What John sees in this vision and in this book that, he, that circulated around the churches in Asia um, is reality as it actually is, that Jesus is Lord and the church is to persevere under persecution. Now, we don't have time to <laughs> dissect the book of Revelation today. We will at some point, I promise. In my pastor pastoral tenure here, we will do that. It's not today, it's not tomorrow, it's not in a couple weeks, but we will, that I promise. But... This book is um, the culmination of the uncovering of reality, and John sees the ending of the story as such. Chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Now, let's take this passage briefly and break it up. First, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. When we read this line, um, here's kind of what typically comes in an individual's mind. Like, heaven and earth now are like the worn-out old version, and then, like, soon we're going to get an upgrade. You know what I mean? Like, new features, leather seats, you know, the whole thing. Like, we're going to get an upgraded version of heaven and earth, and that's not exactly what's happening here. There's not a throwing out of the old and a new. Let me explain a little bit what I mean. First, I want you to notice the language. He sees a new heaven and a new earth. Heaven and earth. Where is the first passage that comes in your mind where those two words are linked together? Genesis. Look at you guys. Genesis, right? What John is clearly saying that's happening here is there's a new creation taking place. Heaven and earth came into being before, and they're doing that very thing again. Now, where we get hung up is the word new, because in English, we only have one word for new, and it's new. But in Greek, they had two. They had neos, which means new in time or recent, as in it didn't exist and now it does, that kind of new. And the second one, kainos, which means new in quality. So the word neos was often used for, like, kids, because they're rather new, wouldn't you say? Like, a two-year-old is, is neos. They're new. They just kind of came into existence not that long ago. 
But kainos is new in quality or in kind, right? It doesn't matter at what point it came into the story, how long it's been there, but its quality is new. Jesus has used this word uh, kainos to talk about um, wineskins before, right? It doesn't matter when the wineskin came into being, but you need a new wineskin, a kainos wineskin, wineskin to receive neos wine. Now, what word do you think John is using here? Kainos. He's saying new in quality. Notice the text does not say he's making all new things. He's making all things new. This is what's happening here. And so it is a new heaven and a new earth. Don't believe me, Michael Gorman. The vision of the new heavens and new earth does not mean the destruction and replacement of the material world, but its transformation, especially the transformation of human existence within that material world. This eschatological reality is not an escape from materiality of existence, but the very fulfillment of material existence. Paradise, the original creation depicted in Genesis, is restored, not abandoned or destroyed. So when we see a new heavens and a new earth, think renewed heavens, renewed earth. That's kind of the imagery that's being shed here. Next, we hear this, and there was no longer any sea. For those of you who are like surfers, that's a total bummer, right? You're like, dude, no sea, what a drag. There's not going to be like a beach, a hammock, a hanging out. Like, that's kind of a bummer, if I'm honest. Or there's other of you who are trying to think about like the ecological makeup of this new earth. And how is the whole thing going to system going to work without an ocean, da, 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 whatever. You're kind of missing the point. For an ancient mind, the sea was representative of chaos. It is all throughout the stories of the scriptures. Who here's been to the ocean? Okay. You know the experience, right? You go out a little bit. It's like to your knees. This is nice. It's refreshing. It's a good time. You get a little bit more courageous. You go out like waist deep. Like there might be a shark out here. I'm kind of worried about that, but whatever. We'll go along. And as you go further, has there ever been a moment where like the currents pulled you or you got smashed by a wave? Terror instantly over your body as you sprint back to the shore, right? Because this thing is powerful and unpredictable. The ancient people felt that, felt that same way about the sea, but even much more so. The Israelites were not a seafaring people. They left that to other people to do. The sea for them was like chaos, bad, whatever, right? Think about the opening of Genesis. We see that the waters covered the earth and it was tohu vavohu, wild and waste, powerful and chaotic. This is the imagery here. So when John says there is no sea, he does not mean there is no like large bodies of water or whatever. What he means to say is there is no chaos. Now, an important word on this, reality of there being no chaos. As we look at the story of the scriptures, some of you might be wondering, well, what about hell? We don't have time to do like a full theology of that today. I'm sorry, but I do want to say this. When the revelation gives the picture of whatever hell may or may not be, it is always depicted as outside of the city. It is outside and away from this reality that God is doing because, because there's no way for God to be good without God being just and bringing righteousness and goodness. And there are entities, spiritual beings, and individuals who are hell-bent on evil. And so in God's new created order, they won't be able to pay, take part. Now, people have all sorts of mixed emotions about this. There's all sorts of different theological categories, universalism, annihilationism, eternal conscious torment. We're not talking about any of that today. Before the, the thrust of the story, here's what you need to know. God is good, and he is just, and his new creation will reflect that very nature. Now, one of the most common motifs for hell, Jesus says, is there... There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, weeping we understand, but gnashing of teeth sounds like a real strange thing. Every single time that phrase, gnashing of teeth, is used in the Bible, it is always of an enemy in raging anger thinking about their enemy. So the gnashing of teeth is not like a consequence of suffering. It is a posture of hatred or vitriol towards their enemy. And so when Jesus describes hell, these people are not there like, oh, man, how did I get here? 
but rather there's a gnashing of teeth. There is a, a vitriol and an anger towards God, towards what he's called good. N.T. Wright, in reflecting on this, says that there's a way of constantly ignoring the image of God and who God has called us to be that we become subhuman. And that is the reality for which hell is made for, those who become subhuman because of this anger, this vitriol, this hatred towards God that has captivated them. C.S. Lewis and other brilliant thinkers have said that, that even if an opportunity was presented to that person, they would not take it. Because, because uh, Dallas Willard says that, that, that heaven is essentially uh, the, the place that only people who could tolerate it will be. That's kind of the hell-bent nature of these individuals. A lot to say here. But all that to say, God will be a good judge. He will bring about justice and goodness and new creation is there. And that will be the removal of of chaos and the ushering of what is good. Just real light stuff today, guys. No big deal. Verse 2. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully prepared for her husband. And I heard a loud voice saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among her people, and he will be with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eye, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, because the old things have passed away. And he who seated on the dude said, I am making everything new. Again, so much happening here. But all throughout the scriptures, the biblical authors have been looking forward to a place called the city of God. It is this full realization of what Eden was meant to be. The place where God will reign and rule with his people like he did in the garden. Now, this vision of this new city developed a name. The name is Zion. As you go through all of the scriptures, the prophets and the poets are all longing for a place called Zion, the place where God's presence will inhabit and be with his people. Zion is the city of God where he will ultimately reign over all the earth from. And so in the scriptures, the new Jerusalem and Zion are interchangeable. Zion is just the name for the new Jerusalem. This is how we got our name. Yeah is this longing for the city of God where he will reign and rule with his people. Now, notice, the city is doing what? It's coming down. No one's getting beamed up, Scotty, to where God is. God's presence, his dwelling place, is coming here to the earth. We are seeing here that the potential of the garden is being fully realized. We are going back to Eden, if you will, but it's being fully realized in a city. Commentator Richard Bakken says this, In the beginning, God has planted a garden for humanity to live in. In the end, he will give them a city. In the new Jerusalem, the blessing of paradise will be restored, but the new Jerusalem is more than paradise regained. As a city, it fulfills humanity's desire to build out built out of nature a human place of human culture and community. What we are seeing here is the garden city brought to completion in Zion. Now, a couple quick things I want to point out. Notice things about this new city. First, no chaos. Second, no death. Third, no tears or mourning. Fourth, no evil. Fifth, this is important, no temple. No place to inhabit God's presence because God will be the temple. He, he, his presence will be unleashed on the world. Ultimately, no light. And again, don't think, well, they're not actually thinking wrong. No light, meaning that God is light and he will cast out all darkness. And lastly, there are gates, but the gates are not closed because there is no fear of evil. The same reason you lock your doors is why, the, or you lock your doors, right, is why you'd close and lock your gate. The gates are wide open because there's no fear of evil. Now, again, so much to talk about there, but in Revelation 22, just a page over, it says that Eden will ultimately be restored in this new city and that we will reign with God forever. Think about a time where humanity is given the responsibility of reigning with God for the first time in the scriptures. That's Genesis 1. They've been the imago Dei, called to reign with God, and at the end of the story, that is fully realized as we reign with God in the new creation. Now next, what's clear that the biblical authors want us to see is that God's presence is fully restored on the earth, where now it's here in pockets and pieces, then it will be fully restored. 
right? This is the fulfillment of Jesus' prayer that he teaches us to pray, that God's kingdom would come, his will would be done on earth as it is where? In heaven. These two spaces being reunited, God's reign fully here. The idea is that the presence of God would permeate every square inch of creation again. The man, the myth, the legend, N.T. Wright. It looks as though God intends to flood the universe with himself. As though the universe, the entire cosmos, was designed as a receptacle for his love. The world was made for the presence of God, and that is restored again. And this is the future hope, the end of the story of God. And it is to this end that we look forward to. Brief note. When we think about the new creation, this reality, notice it's described as a city. So what I don't want you to think of is like disembodied spirits floating around. I don't know, just like worshiping and hovering around. It's going to be like earth made new. You will have a physical body that's been resurrected by the Lord Jesus, like Jesus' resurrected body, and you will do some of the very same things you're doing now, creating and dreaming and, and, exp and expressing all of these things that God has placed inside of you in a renewed world. So don't think like lame 90s worship service. Think the best parts about your life now are glimmers into the future. Uh, C.S. Lewis in talking about this says that when you experience these amazing moments that kind of transcend through, you're smelling a flower you have yet to see. You're looking forward to a time that's coming. So like, don't think that the kingdom coming is going to be like super lame, but it's better than the other place. Think about it as the very best moments of your life are just a shadow of what it will be. Now, in Paul's letter to the Romans, as they're going through hardship, he reminds them of this future hope when he says this, Romans 8, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God, you and myself, to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. So Paul is writing to a community who's hurting here, and he reminds them of the future hope they have. First, he doesn't say what's happening isn't bad. He says what's coming is just better. It's not even worthy to be compared. He's saying, I'm not saying what's happening to you guys now isn't, doesn't feel like the worst, but I'm telling you, it can't even be compared to the glory that comes. Second, this is such a dope line. He says that creation is an eager expectation for the revealing of the sons of God. This, this realization when all of humanity is resurrected and creation is renewed. That phrase, eager expectation, has the connotation behind it of on tiptoes with your neck stretched. I'm a short guy, so if I like go somewhere and there's like a high thing, I'm doing that all the time, right? Trying to see what's over the horizon. As kids, they do that all the time to see what's happening over the horizon of their vision. It is that image of on tiptoes, on the edge of eternity, looking forward to what is coming. That's what the creation's doing. It's longing for that moment, excited to see what's just coming over the horizon, right? Um, in this story, Jesus is the first fruits or the beginning of resurrection life. So all the biblical authors want us to see is that Jesus is a sign of the things coming for all of humanity. Just as God's, God raised Jesus from the dead by the power of the Spirit, he will do the same for you. That's the hope. And so Jesus is the first fruits of that. And all of humanity will ultimately be resurrected um, with all of creation. So it is in this final act of the story, new creation, God is making all things new. You and me and the world we live in and his presence fully restored. So you know how the story ends now, but this begs the question, how then shall I live? And for that, we go back to the act of the church. Now, to tell the story of the act of the church, I want to root this in an illustration I thought was super helpful by N.T. Wright. He says this, imagine... For all of you theater buffs, we came across a lost Shakespearean play. And it's a six-act six act play. We have acts one through four. We have 
a portion of five, and we have, the, we have all of six. Now, this is remarkable. This is a huge find, and the first thing we want to do is do this play. It's never been done before. We have to do it. So there's a few options that you can do in thinking about going about this play. One is just like have some people fill in the gaps and write it, but that would feel kind of inauthentic to um, what's happened here, what Shakespeare has written. So the best thing to do is to hire Shakespearean actors, people who have been doing plays for Sh of Shakespeare their whole lives, who are immersed in his literature, in his writing, and in that culture. You give them the story. They see where the story ends, where it's going, all the builds, whatever, and they innovate and improvise the section that's missing. It is this idea that I want us to root the story of God in. Right? The two things that are necessary for those actors to continue the story well is both innovation and consistency. First, innovation. They're going to have to, like, play the story out. Now, what they, what they can't do, right, is abandon the other half of this thing, which is consistency. Right? They can't just change narrative arcs or change character motivations because they know the end of the story. It has to be in alignment with the story altogether. But what they can do is they can innovate within the pre-existing framework of the story to fill in the gaps. This is essentially what's happening with the scriptures. We have basically the whole thing, but this small portion where you and I exist, and it's here, we're called to be innovative and be consistent with the remaining of, remainder of the story. Now, this is what we kind of see starting in the book of Acts. Luke opens his book, the book of Acts, like this. He says, in my former book, the Gospel of Luke, Theophilus, I wrote, all, I wrote about all the things Jesus began to do and teach. The assumption that the second installment is writing about the things that Jesus continued to do through his disciples. The book of Acts is all about answering the question, how then shall we live in light of the good news about Jesus? So because we know almost all of the story, we, like those actors, are called to those, those postures of innovation and consistency. Now that we have a proper grasp of the future hope, it unleashes a vision of present hope that is the basis for how we live here and now. So first, we are the embodiment of new creation. Paul says this in his letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. Paul is making an extraordinary claim here. He says, because of what Jesus has done, new creation is not something we wait for. It's something that's already happening right now in you. Now, something super cool that's happening here in the Greek that we can't see in English is it's really bad grammar. But essentially what Paul is doing here is he says this. If anyone is in, his, if anyone is in Christ, new creation he, like, doesn't even finish the sentence. He interjects in the middle of the sentence just to shout, new creation has come forth. Some translations have ta taken this and said, um, and become a new creature. Lame. Don't do that, right? That's not, a, that's not exactly what Paul is doing here. He's saying new creation is breaking through. It's not particular to an individual. It's particular to the community of Jesus and what's happening in our midst. So, I want you to recall Jesus' baptism from last week. He goes through the waters of baptism, and when he does, the Spirit descends on him like a dove. All a call back to Genesis, the Spirit hovering over the waters in Genesis 1, bringing about creation, and in Jesus, new creation. Then Jesus says, this very same thing will happen to us, right? Jesus is crucified. Three days later, he rises from the grave. And when the biblical authors look back on the moment Jesus rose from the grave, do you know what they say about it? That it was the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the grave. That there, in the midst of death, God is bringing forth life by the way and power of the Spirit. Now, Jesus' resurrection is to be clearly seen as the new creation breaking in. Resurrection is the dawn of new creation. And so... This is why Paul interjects in the middle, if anyone is in Christ, new creation, because he wants you to see what's happening here. Now, after Jesus rises and spends some time with his disciples, he gathers them together, and this is what he tells them, Acts 1, verses 4 through 5. 
On one occasion, he was eating with them, and he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying, what's happened at my baptism will happen to you. You will be submerged in the Holy Spirit. A few days later, Jesus, after Jesus spoke these words, tend to be exact, after he ascended to the right hand of God, the Spirit fell on the church known as Pentecost, on the festival known as Pentecost. Today is the celebration of Pentecost, that right now we celebrate with the rest of the global church the awakening of the church through the empowerment of the Spirit, the coming of the new creation through the power of the Spirit. Now, I want you to remember Jesus' resurrection is to be seen as new creation, but it's to be seen as the first fruits of new creation. It's an agricultural term. It means the first bit of crops that come out, the first tomato, the first jalapeno, first fruits. He's the first of a harvest that's coming. The day that Jesus, that the, that the Spirit falls on the church is Pentecost, also known as the Feast of First Fruits. Somebody, come on. You don't need to clap, but dude, sick, right? That the birth of the church is the beginning of new creation. It is the first fruits of all that's to come. Just, that's for free, guys. You get all this stuff for free. All right. So this celebration happening is when the church receives the empowering of God's Holy Spirit, and it is the feast of first fruits, and it's today that we celebrate that reality. Now, here's what happened. Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, as Jesus had told them. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated that came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. I've done multiple sermons on this. So go back, listen to the message called People of Pentecost. I did like a whole thing here. But few things quickly. This is a weird scene. Can you be honest? Imagine you strolled in this Sunday morning, and all of a sudden, a gust of wind blew to the place. There were small pockets of fire over everyone's head, and they, everyone was speaking in different languages. You would have walked in, looked, walked out, right? Mm -mm, no part of that, right? What is even happening? What's happening here is clearly seen throughout the story of the scriptures that the people of God have become a living temple. All throughout the story, right, it was in, in, in the beginning, heaven and earth were together. Heaven and earth were ripped apart. God's presence was pulled, but God made a promise that he would still be with his people. First, it was a tabernacle, a tent in the desert where God's presence would come. When his spirit filled the tabernacle, wind and fire. Moving forward in the story, they establish a permanent tabernacle in a temple. When God's presence filled the tabernacle, wind and fire we are to see the church coming together being filled because remember when jesus dies the temple veil is torn his spirit is unleashed in the world and now we're to see that his spirit comes to dwell with god's people and they become a living temple peter draws on this analogy when he says in first peter as you come to him the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by god and precious to him you are like living stones being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering acceptable sacrifices available to god through jesus christ the church is to be seen as a holy priesthood and the new temple the place where god's spirit dwells paul in writing to this church in corinth says do you not know that y'all are the temple of the holy spirit all of us together collectively are the place where God's spirit dwells. Now, this is wonderful, great news, but there's kind of an elephant in the room in that, well, if this is all happening, why does a lot of like evil and bad things still happen? Like if new creation has already come, why are we living in the, in the still in this area of brokenness? Well, this is developing an idea that scholars called the now and not yet of the kingdom. When Jesus tells his disciples about the coming of the Spirit, they ask him a question. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. 
they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Effectively, they're asking, is Zion coming? Is the new Jerusalem on the way? Are you going to rule and reign here? Jesus' response, it's not for you to know the time and dates or dates that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. The question they're asking is, God, are you coming to rule and reign here in fullness? And Jesus responds, that day is still on the way, but in the meantime, you get my spirit. It's the now in breaking of new creation and the not yet, the kingdom coming. The church exists in the in-between of two ages, the old age and the new age, the age we live in and the age to come. This is how all the biblical authors talk about it. And so the old age is where the power of sin is present, and the new age where the power of the Spirit comes and brings regeneration, and the church lives in this in-between phase. Right? On one hand, the kingdom is here. It has come. The new creation is here. But on the other hand, there's still the power of sin and death. And Jesus isn't reigning here fully yet. We live in between the now and the not yet. Richard Hayes says, the old age is passing away. The new age has appeared in Christ. And the church stands at the juncture between them. When Paul thinks about this, time in between the times, he says this. For while we are in this tent, in this body, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but clothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this purpose is God, who has given us his spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what's to come. First, Paul notes that our bodies now are infected with sin, but... There is coming a day where we will get kainos bodies, new bodies, not, uh, n- uh, not neos new, kainos new. So you're not going to like look like Brad Pitt in the new creation or anything like that. You will be you, image of God, the way he's made you, but made new. This is why um, you see this with Jesus, that Jesus is somewhat recognizable and um, he's able to also like teleport through walls and stuff like that. He's got holes in his hands, but he's also able to eat. We see this, uh, some of these images with Jesus' resurrected body, the same will be for us. Now, we long to be further clothed, meaning it's not a doing away with our bodies, but our resurrected bodies to make us truly human, like Adam and Eve were, able to live in both God's space and our space, like Jesus' resurrected body. Now, lastly, what has God done? He didn't have to do this, but what did he do? He gave us the spirit as a guarantee. Now, this isn't like those commercials, like satisfaction guaranteed. This is a down payment of what's to come. This is the idea behind a guarantee here. Jesus has has given us his spirit as a first fruits of all the new new creation that is going to come. Uh, Richard Hayes says this, the spirit endowed church stands between the present age as a sign of what is to come, already prefiguring the redemption for which it awaits. In short, the reality that God's empowering present, the person of the Spirit, lives inside of you is a sign that just as Jesus was resurrected, so will you and so will all of creation. So what do we do with this sign as of new creation? We, in the language of the biblical authors, bear witness Michael Goheen, Craig Bartholomew, God gives this in-between time to the church as its own to fulfill its calling as his witnesses to the coming of the kingdom. Notice the last line of Jesus is saying in Acts 1. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and all of the world. So what does it mean to bear witness to the reality that the kingdom has come here and now in the age we live in? Well, at its simplest, it means to share the good news, to tell the story of God. So many people reject the good news about Jesus because the church is telling the wrong story. We're telling the first story that I showed you. We don't start with being made in the Imago Dei. We start with being sinners. We don't end with a new creation. We end with, so you better hope you're right or else you'll be left. You know what I'm saying? That's the kind of language that we use. It is not a compelling story. And it's not the story of the scriptures. We reduce the story to little bits and fragments of it, not telling the story as it was meant to be told. We are not stewarding the message that we've been told. 
part of sharing the good news is announcing that eternal life is available now through Jesus. Not just some future event. Right now, eternal life is available to people. Well, you might be thinking, oh, I thought that happened when we died. Not according to Jesus. Jesus said eternal life is knowing him. Eternal life is available now and will be fully realized in the future. The hope of the scriptures is not merely getting to heaven when you die, but it's new creation coming here. Now remember, according to Jesus, eternal life is knowing him. Dallas Willard, eternal life in the individual does not begin after death, but at the point where God touches the individual with redeeming grace and draws them into a life interacted with himself and his kingdom. So the hope that we have is not only a future hope, it's a present hope. Now, here is something you should know. We don't build the kingdom. It's important you understand that. God does. And he does it through us, but it's not up to us to build the kingdom. And he right. God builds God's kingdom, but God ordered his world in such a way that his own work within the world takes place not least through one of his creatures, in particular, namely, human beings who reflect his image. He has enlisted us to act as stewards in the project of creation. He has built into the gospel message the fact that through the work of Jesus and the power of the Spirit, he equips humans to help in the work of getting the project back on track. To say it plainly, your job isn't to save anybody. Your job isn't to be the Spirit. Your job isn't to bring conviction. Your job is just to tell the story. And if you're faithful to tell the story, God will be faithful to build his kingdom through his church. Now, last idea on bearing witness is to live a compelling life. Peter, in his letter, says this, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Can I just be really honest? Much of the reason our witness fails is because we aren't living compelling lives. We just aren't. One, many of us are entangled in sin. How can we come and proclaim freedom to the world if we ourselves are still in bondage? You can't. Two, we are discipled by the world. We look no different than anybody else, so why would anybody be drawn to our life? It is clear here in, Paul, in Peter's letter that the way that the church stands out is through faithful resistance. It's through resisting the discipleship and way of the world and living in the way of Jesus, but doing it in a way that's compelling, that draws people in. Peter is riffing on Jesus who said that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That same thing is what Peter is saying here. And third, to be totally honest, our story stinks. It just does. You know, we come up, what do you do if you die tonight, right? And it's like, what kind of start of a conversation is that, right? It's like, this guy's a weirdo, dude, <laughs> you know? Is he threatening me? Is that a threat? You know, what's happening? No, a compelling witness by the way you're living your life. And not starting with sin, but starting with the Imago Dei and ending with new creation. John Ortberg says this, He invites you as a gracious gift to become an agent of the kingdom, to experience God's reign in your own life, body, and will, and then become, I love this, a conduit of God's power, joy, and love to a bruised and bleeding humanity all around you. This is the call of the church. Lastly, we're to be a unified family. This is one of my favorite themes in the scripture. I'm running out of time. I'm gonna go through this fast. Eh, kind of fast, uh, fast enough. So um, in the scriptures, God is always setting apart a remnant to reach the nations to make one family. That's always been the goal. Think of Genesis 12. I will bless you, Abraham, so that you will be a what? Blessing to the who? Nations. God is setting apart Abraham to reach the nations. Same, things happen, same thing happens with the church. And so that what will happen is that the nations will ultimately become the family of God. We see the same thing in Jesus. Jesus sets apart a remnant of 12 disciples to go and to reach the who? The nations that they would become one family. It is all throughout the scriptures. The remnant to all to become the family of God. It is a pattern repeated through the scriptures. Now, here's what's beautiful. When the Spirit falls on Pentecost, 
there is a representation of a variety of languages there in that gathering. That people are hearing the good news about Jesus proclaimed in their own language. That God's vision has always been a global vision. That all of humanity would come to him, repent, and believe in him. And that his family would extend to the ends of the world. In Revelation 5, we get this beautiful picture of all of humanity worshiping the Lamb. And it says of that people, it is every tribe, tongue, and nation. The vision is always global. From the beginning, it's been for the nations. In the end, it will be the nations proclaiming Jesus is Lord. That's the global vision. And so Jesus, in making this new family, do you know what he prays for in the garden? That we would be unified. It is the assumption of the biblical authors then a unified church tells the story of who God is. It is human nature to be tribal, to fracture, to separate, to divide. And it's the conviction of the biblical authors that the most compelling witness the church can offer is our unity, is our togetherness for the good news about Jesus. And it's like Jesus says something like that. They will know that you are my disciples by the way, you attack each other viciously online and divide over trivial issues, right? That's what he said. Oh, it's, they will know you're my disciples by the love you have one for another. The compelling witness of the world is that the church is a multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-economic tier status. It is every tribe, tongue, and nation coming together underneath one reality, Jesus. Now, throughout history, there have been many people to try and gather the world, right? Uh, dictatorships and powerful leaders and charismatic leaders, and all of them have failed but one. This poor Jewish rabbi from Nazareth who came and led a movement of people who now, today, around the world, every tribe, tongue, and nation is worshiping and celebrating. The Spirit has come. The church is born. There's nothing like it in all the world. And Paul, in his letter to Ephesians, which we'll get to soon, says that this gathering of the church, it proclaims the manifold wisdom of God to all the world. God's ability to gather a unified people together. There's a lot here. Some of you might feel like you've just drunk out of a fire hose. Good news is you're not thirsty. Uh, bad news is you're choking a little bit. But this begs the question, how then shall you live? I'm going to close now. Some of you are like, let's go. There were a few reasons why we decided to do this sermon series. First, most people don't know this is the story of the Bible. They have some truncated version of it, some half-truth version of it. They just don't know this is the story. Secondly, there's really bad teaching around this story that we're trying to undo and establish new and better frameworks for. Third, my hope in this series, and this is my genuine hope, is that I tried my very best to show you how beautiful this story is, like how absolutely beautiful it is, and how thoughtful and wonderful it is. And so my hope is that this is how I know this was a good sermon series and not like good for my part, but good in terms of what the spirit is doing. If it leads you back into the story, like if it gives in you a hunger for God's word, a hunger for what he's doing in the world, a hunger to immerse yourself in the story. That's a win. That's what, I'm, what we're trying to do here is to do that is to create a hunger. And lastly, the, one of the last reasons is this, that we might be people who live into this story. Now that you know the story, you've been given the script, if you will. You know all the acts. Will you participate in it? Will you be what God is doing? Will you, be, will you partner with God with what he's doing in the world today? Will you say yes to the invitation of the Spirit to be a part of God's global family who is proclaiming the, mission, the message, the kingdom has come and it's on the way? Will we be new creation kind of people? It begs the question, 
how then shall I live? And that's a question you have to answer.